Okay. I think we lost most of our Lucene people. The Americans didn't make it this morning. Um, so Berlin buzzwords. Uh, I think the best buzzword of the whole event is Berlin. This is an amazing city for me. I discovered it now. Um, thanks to Isabel and Jan and Simon and, and Julie for, Julia for organizing this amazing event. And thanks to all of you for coming here and letting me talk. I love talking. Um, I discovered some things about Berlin. It's like the, the subway goes above the ground, which is amazing. And uh, they have a great beer by the river. If you missed that, you missed a great thing. And they have like a, a holiday for anarchists, the 1st of May. So I must come back on the 1st of May and buy a bicycle. You know. OK, I'd like everyone to stand up, please. Everybody, two feet. I know. You can close the, you can close the, the, the laptops. OK. <laughs> You can all sit down again. That's just an excuse to get you to close your computers and actually listen to me. <laughs> Thanks. OK. So I'm a programmer. Like, I think most of you are programmers. Anyone not a programmer here? Any lawyers? OK. Um, but let's, let's put our hands up if you write code. This is easy than standing, OK? So we write code. Uh, if we only write code that runs on, keep your hands up. Come on. Some exercise in the morning gets the, the blood moving, right? If you only write code that runs on a single thread, on a single core, you can put your hand down. Ah, so more hands up. If you write code that runs on, you know, like several threads, several cores, keep your hands up. Most people still. OK. And this is the world we live in today. We run, you know, we run our software on, on machines, on threads, on cores that spread out. And this was different when I was a young programmer. You know, a machine was the thing. It was a <laughs> actually was embarrassingly small. But um, even the big machines still ran as, as one thing. Today, that's stopped. Now it's clouds. And even internally in companies, it's clouds. And it's really hard as a, as a programmer to know how to write software for the clouds. We don't really have the tools. So I will try to convince you today that there are really good tools for this that we've actually made and we will try to you know, get you to use. So let's kind of decide, kind of scope the problem out. What we have are applications written in, in languages of all kinds, running on boxes, trying to make the most use of memory and CPU and network. And we have network connections between these applications. So usually we're trying to distribute our data or our intelligence in some way. Things talk to each other. We have teams that work on different pieces. Over time, we replace, we come in. We have clustering, failover. So we're using this, this, this bunch of technology and most applications, and most of us, will actually use networking in our code. Actually, we'll talk to, to TCP or UDP actually in our applications, which I think is a really big mistake. I'll explain why. So what are the kind of the best solutions that we have for building scalable, what I call elastic architectures? I guess the classic solution is multi-threading. So languages like Java and, well, most modern languages have some kind of threading capacity, capability, where you, you, you lock data and you make critical sections. I'll walk around, this is nice. And um, you have like your code and you have to like share code, so you lock it and you make sure that no one else is going to access it while you lock it. And you try to minimize the time that you lock data and you have real, you have problems of contention and hot locks and two-step dances, and you have all these weird things you have to learn to be a good multi-threaded programmer. And the code gets, gets, gets more and more complex and harder and harder to write. Is anyone disagreeing with me at this point? Because I'm giving you a kind of a, a vision. Anyone think I'm really wrong on this? That the multi-threaded code is hard to write? OK, good, no hands up. And if you actually look at a, 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 a serious multi-threaded application running on a, on a big box many cores, it won't actually scale. As you increase the number of threads and cores, you get more and more contention. And it will just max out. So diminishing returns at, I don't know, five or 10 cores actually stops, stops getting any, any, any better. And yet, the boxes that we're buying, 16 cores, it will be 32 cores, 64 cores. Even my mobile phone will have two or four cores soon. And how do we use this? OK. Well, there are other solutions. People have concepts like lightweight threads where one single operating system thread can handle many virtual threads, and they kind of co, you know, co-routine and cooperate, and there's no locking. Well, that's nice, nice programming model. Done that for many years. But still doesn't really scale, because it runs on too few cores. 
How do you scale to 100 cores? How do you scale to 10,000 cores across 100 boxes? OK, then we have some languages like Erlang, which is a nice language uh, as an example. I don't program Erlang, by the way. I only know about it, and I've seen what it's capable of. And that's really nice. You can now write code which acts like little threads, no locking, and can stretch across, across boxes. But it's a, it's a language. I mean, you have to learn a language and change your, your team and your way you're thinking. And I just don't like that. I mean, it doesn't work in the real world. You can't convince teams to learn new languages as a condition for solving some problem. So then we have, I guess, where my company comes from, messaging. Messaging is, a, is, a, is a kind of like the last big unsolved problem in, in IT, I think, at least today. Um, let you connect pieces together and shove data between them. And most messaging systems are, are quite good, but they're complex. They're big. They do a lot. They do stuff like you know, mapping from ASCII to EBCDIC if it's an IBM messaging system, or they will, they will you know, do they will format data for you and decide how to encode byte strength, whatever. It does, they do a lot of stuff for you. But in fact, that kind of stops them being useful in, in systems level code. So if we're writing, let's say we're writing a database. Database has to have some kind of clustering replication, has to talk masters to slaves, data gets moved around. How do we do this? Well, if we have to put a messaging broker in there to act as our bus, it's not going to work. It won't be fast enough. It'll be too complex. It might just be too expensive. It'll break in strange ways. And well, one, more, one more moving piece is just you know, a problem in that kind of system. So kind of an ideal solution would be something like messaging, able to talk, get pieces to talk together really easily, but very, very lightweight. And I think the, my favorite buzzword of all is simplicity. And making things simple is actually really hard. That's the biggest challenge in software. Making things complex is really, really easy. Anyone can do that. Simplicity is, there are several tricks to it. One of the tricks is to identify like natural patterns that, that kind of work. Um, like in Berlin, you know, the bicycle is a natural pattern. It hasn't changed in 100 years. Two wheels, a chain. People try to make like different kind of bikes, you know, fat wheels, chopper style. Forget it. The bike model is a natural pattern which works really well and it will survive for a long time. And in software, we have natural patterns like this which work really well. And if you can pull them out and identify them and then formalize them in an abstraction, then you get, you get real power and it can be wrapped up in a very nice way. Uh, like yesterday, I saw a presentation on MongoDB. Being able to insert a whole object, a complex object in one go, is a natural pattern. It's much more obvious than trying to create many rows which represent one object in one transaction. It's an unnatural pattern. So having an insert of a complex object, one operation, gets you the same result as doing an insert of 100, 100 rows with a transaction, but it's much, much simpler. So in messaging, we have the same, the same kind of um, problems of identifying of work. And there are some natural patterns that work really well. They take years to find, though, years. Well, what are they? They're, for example, asynchronous. Asynchronous is a natural pattern. If you have code that runs in many places, it shouldn't be talking in a synchronous fashion. That's just a really bad idea. It's fragile. Things break. Things don't use the CPUs properly. They're not working at full speed. So asynchronous means you send data, and you get data back. And when data arrives, you work on it. So you're basically event processing, another natural pattern, with queues, nice pattern. So think of your code as a bunch of tasks. Each task is single thread. Each task has a queue or queues that it reads off and processes data from. That's kind of the architecture of a distributable application. A distributable means that this same task can run on one core, you can have two tasks on one core, two tasks on two cores in the same machine, or two tasks and two processes on different machines. And it's really the same code. This begins to get interesting. So then how do you connect these tasks together? Well, you want some way to get a, a message from one task into the queue of another task. It's kind of your basic operation. Messages are not complex. They're blobs, binary data. No need to formalize what goes in that. No need to say it's going to be XML or this or that. It's just a blob of data, zero bytes to 
as much as your memory can hold gigabytes. Another natural pattern is no persistence. And people will complain about this in messaging. The first question we always get asked is, so how do you do reliability? And I kind of say, well, we, we, don't really, we don't really need to. In some cases, you can add it in. But mostly, you make things really reliable in terms of simplicity, make them work well. And then <laughs> the need to save stuff to this, needs, the need to, to recover, just almost goes away. Not completely, but almost. <coughs> so it's like your, you know, the internet switch is not reliable. If it gets too full, it just throws away packets. And the same with queues. When they fill up, you just throw away data. Kind of a sim very simple pattern, which solves many problems of, of robustness. So then you have this queuing system now where tasks read stuff of queues, and then queues get connected across transport protocols. What do we have? We have in-memory. We have uh, shared memory. We have inter-process communication. Maybe we have TCP local. Maybe we have it remote. Maybe we have UDP, multicast, SCTP, whatever. Actually, we don't really care. This is a, an administration issue. It's a topology issue. Developers shouldn't care about that at all. It shouldn't matter. Conceptually, you're doing multicast. Doesn't, you don't matter, it doesn't matter whether you're using TCP multicast, UDP multicast, SCTP multicast. You're talking from one to many. That's your pattern as a developer. So you want that to be abstracted in whatever layer there is. So this layer that we have, which I'll just show you the website, 0MQ. We began making this about two years ago. And the goal was to make a really, really lightweight, really, really fast messaging library. That was kind of the original goal. Now, what it became is quite interesting. It became a kind of a new socket type. We have UDP sockets, we have TCP sockets, we have SCTP sockets, and we have 0MQ sockets. Now, sockets are nice because they're a very well-known, very, very simple API, easy to understand. You create a socket. You bind it to a local address. You connect to an endpoint. You read and you write. That's it. The API is well known to all of us. It takes five minutes to understand. Now, behind the sockets are natural patterns. So what we have in 0MQ are a bunch of natural messaging patterns built into these sockets. They're not complex, but they're a little bit subtle. There's a pub-sub pattern. That means that one socket can talk to many sockets. We don't have this in TCP but it works in 0MQ. So sockets will connect, and when they've connected, and if they're pops up sockets, when the publisher sends a message, all the sockets that are connected to it will get the message. Another pattern is request reply. So it's how you talk to a service. Again, you will connect to a service socket. You send a message. The service task will get the message, process it, and send a reply back, and it comes back to your application. And both are working asynchronously. So the basic loop of the task is send something, wait, process, and loop on that. Things like queuing are done invisibly, automatically. So if the, serv the service task is reading from a socket, that's asynchronous. It gets a message, it processes it. In the meantime, clients can be sending it more messages. They will queue up. There can be one or 10 or 100 messages in the queue. That's invisible to the task. As an administrator, you can do things like specify the maximum size of your queue, and then it will throw away or it will, it will start to block, depending on the, on the messaging pattern. And another messaging pattern that's in 0MQ is a peer-to-peer -peer message, a uh, peer-to-peer -peer connection, which is quite unusual, useful in some cases, where you want to connect to exactly one endpoint and own that connection. These are building blocks, then. With these building blocks, you can build distributable applications. So as a developer, you're thinking, OK, what's the cost of this? What's, this sounds really great, but what's the, what's the impact of this on, you know, on my, what's the footprint on my, on my server? In terms of raw performance, it does a lot of work very cheaply. So it can do like 8 million messages a second over, over InfiniBand. The actual cost of a message going through the stack is, is, is down to a few microseconds. I think end-to-end -end latency is about between 10 and 20 microseconds, depending on your network. The footprint of the library is, is, is very small. It's, 
If I would compare with SQL, I would look at SQLib. ZeroMQ is a bit like that. It's a, it's, a, it's a library that's plugged into your application, and the footprint is like 10 or 20K of code compiled. It's LGPL, so there's no cost in terms of money. Um, there's not much cost in terms of learning. I would say the biggest cost is in terms of your architectural decisions. It will impact the way you write your code. You will get multi-threading code with, with no locks, with no concurrency issues, with no shared data, with no, no deadlocks, with no waiting. Uh, when you do it properly, you can get threads that run on a core and use the whole core 100% with absolutely no wait states. And you can do this to 32 cores on one machine, to 100 machines on a network. This is quite amazing. And you can do it in any language. Because Ethereum is a library with language bindings. Well, we have basically everything, I think, in there. And because the API is so simple, it's really easy to make a new language binding. So we have a couple of people here who actually made language bindings. Go. Where's the Go gentleman? OK. The sweet possibly. <laughs> Now, it's, a, it's also an interesting project for, for my company, because we've been doing open source for a long time. I've been writing open source since 91, 92. But this is our first really successful community. And the community makes it interesting. It's, it's, most of the people working on it are volunteers. Most of the, the packaging, the language binds done by volunteers. And it's helped us to really define the product. Over time, people want it simpler. They tell us we don't want extra functionality, we want it to be reliable, above all, robust, fast. And so we now have this application space, existing old network space, and in between that, zero MQ. That's the proposition. <laughs> so that's it, basically. It's not a complicated proposal. Um, We'll do like five minutes of questions on that. And then we're going to switch to something completely different just for fun, because we're all getting tired already. So questions on 0MQ? What's the license? The license is LGPL. If you're a contributor, then patches are submitted under MIT license. Uh, Sorry? Yes. We're actually just releasing a stable 2.0 version now. So the API is stable, it won't change. The, the code itself is very, very stable. It's used in production by actually quite a lot of teams. Um, most of the users for this are people who traditionally use messaging already and want something cheaper. That's kind of the classic use case. So they're like small trading companies, um, supercomputing projects. There's some university doing a monkey brain interface very strange on this. So the, 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 the classic use case are people who have messaging, but it's too slow or too expensive. And this is just much cheaper and much faster. That's kind of the classic use case. What we're also seeing are actually open source developers who are just mixing it with other stuff in really weird ways. Uh, there's one guy who just plugged it into libtask. Libtask is a, a library for C, which gives you a coroutine. And now that works with zero MQ. So you have the coroutines distributed across it's just freaky stuff. Um, a guy made a project called No No SQL. It's now called MulletDB, which mixes zero MQ with a bunch of different backends: uh, 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 key key value cache, a database, and file system. And applications can basically write to different database types through zero MQ, and the whole thing is spreads out elastically again. These are interesting little projects. They they show how how when we have access to a really effective messaging which is very cheap and very elastic. It changes the way that we think. We're no longer constrained by the cost of writing communications, which has been really high. If you look at how you actually make a socket work in an application, it's been really expensive. You have error handling. You have to have your select working properly. It impacts how your threading works. It's really messy. And yet, we solve these problems over and over and over again. So this, this is supposed to be like, a, a, you know, it's finished. This problem is now solved. It's not a complete solution yet. It's still a very simple solution but it does handle the questions of network communications and threading and locking and concurrency in a, in a simple package. We are? Oh. Uh, yes, thank you. So what's the difference between CRMQ and like AMQP or? 
Last like time, I, I discussed this at the, <laughs> the bar camp, and the only tweet about the whole presentation was, Hinchins attacks AMQP one more time. So, no, I'm not going to discuss AMQP today, except to say that AMQP is a great, a great, great protocol. I love it. It's a bit complex, though. <laughs> and it takes a little bit of time to learn, a little bit too long of time to learn. I mean, AMQP is actually a wire-level protocol. So it's designed like a kind of... Uh, an HTTP, except it's not text, you can't tell net. You have to write code that makes this binary framing. But there's like lots and lots of binary frames, and they take ages and ages to understand and write, and most of them don't do very much. I mean, most of it is setting up, setting up work. It shouldn't be that complex. And MQP takes a long time to learn. It, just the metaphors are a bit complex. I like the patterns in there, but they're just not quite right. And the problem with messaging is that if, it's, if it takes you three weeks or a month to understand it, then you can't use it, unless you're a big team in a big company. So that's really the problem, is, is how do you make it simple enough that people can take it in a day and use it in a day, in a weekend? Because if it's not a weekend project, it doesn't work anymore. The, the people don't have time to, you know, in your own free time to spend two months learning a new technology. And so AMQP will succeed in teams that are paid to spend months and months learning technology. But they won't succeed for me in open source. So in a distributed architecture like this, how would you instrument wait times between the components? You mean how would you measure it? Yeah. You'd use a tool like Intel Thread Checker and just observe what's going on. It's the best thing. It's very, very hard to know what multi-threaded applications actually are doing. As soon as you look at them, they change. That's one thing. So with, with ZeroMQ, what we did in the beginning of the project was spent about six months actually profiling and, and testing different parts of the stack and actually measuring what it, what it takes to send data through the stack. So the testability, the, the measurement of performance is really, really important for a product like this. You can't afford to be guessing about what things are going on. Uh, so what we can tell you is that you know, the library will take this much time. On top of that, if you're, if you're doing other stuff, if you're doing locking of any kind, you're in trouble. So if you're not using the, you know, the one task per thread with a queue model, then you're going to be in trouble. As soon as you start waiting for stuff, you're in trouble. But if you're not doing locking, if you're waiting on queues, then you won't have any wait states. If you have multiple, th multiple threads in one core, they may be conflicting, obviously. If the threads are important, you put them one per core. And then that's it, they run at full speed. Also, sy systemic degradation. If you have a process where multiple queues are waiting for one processor, one process. Well, in the nature of asynchronous programming, uh, things will wait on, on other things happening, right? But that wait costs you nothing. And the wait stops immediately as there's something to do. So you're only waiting if there's no work. So threads can be lazy, that's fine. But there's no conflicts. There's no waiting impatiently. There's no, you know, I want to work, but I can't work. It never happens. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, what kind of objects can be sent uh, through this <coughs> message queue? Uh, if is there is some support for serialization? Mm -hmm. And uh, the second uh, question is about uh, is there support for um, uh, streaming to sending uh, very long uh, blobs? Right. So in terms of serialization and message formats, we don't do that. We don't care. We send blobs. Uh, the the while level protocol for ZeroMQ is lovely. It has a, just a length header and a content, and that's it. There's no other. And le length header is variable, so it will, it will be very short for small messages and be longer for larger messages. And it's up to you in the application to serialize on and off. Now, most people will not actually use a product like ZeroMQ directly. What they will do is they will build a simple framework of some kind that abstracts some other application requirements. So ZeroMQ is not meant to be a high-level product. It's meant to be a technology which lets you build frameworks really cheaply and easily. So m most applications will have some serialization. Uh, and again, if you do that right, you can talk between different languages. If you can't, you're in trouble. 
you, may, you may have, you know, you may send text messages, you may do whatever you like in there. Not our problem. We will just deliver binary data. <coughs> One message will get delivered, any size. Your second question was about, sorry. Streaming, yes. So streaming basically is about sending frames. Frames are messages. You may lose or not lose frames depending on your protocol. If it's TCP, you will get all your frames. If it's UDP, you will lose random frames. Uh, we are working with uh, OpenPGM, Miru, a company in Hong Kong, to have reliable PGM, reliable multicast. But basically, streaming would be break it into frames and send each frame as one message. Acknowledgements on messages. In zero MQ, no. Uh, again, depending on your transport, if you're using TCP, you don't need that directly, because TCP will guarantee delivery as long as your connection is up. And zero MQ will actually queue the message if it doesn't have a connection, and it will send it when a connection comes. TCP is okay for that. However, it won't protect you against a crashing process, for example. So if you need actual acknowledgement of messages, you do it in the application level. I think eventually we will put this into zero MQ, but we're really, really careful about not making the core product too sophisticated. As soon as you start having acknowledgements, then you have problems like, well, I want to have a transaction. I want to have some kind of persistence. I want to have some kind of queuing in there, explicit queuing. And the thing just gets complex right away, and then unpredictably slow. And then you're in trouble. So there is in zero MQ the notion of a device, which is like a, a little micro broker you can stick in the network and use for specialized tasks. There are devices that will do like shared queues, devices that will do uh, one to many. So you can do like a unicast to a forwarder device, but then multicast out to subscribers. And we could have devices that do, for example, reliability eventually. There's a delicate balance with this kind of product about keeping the APIs and the technology, the core technology, really, really simple. Um, and we're deliberately you know, not doing stuff to make that possible. We have questions at the back, yes? We'll use the microphone. Yeah. Um, is there any kind of service discovery? What happens if a node dies and restarts? Does it connect itself to the network? Right. So currently in Zero MQ, all the nodes are, wow, that screen's out of focus, isn't it? Do we have anyone with a, with a focus button on the screen? Because they're, okay. So service discovery, no. Zero MQ basically assumes that you tell it where things are. So right now you, you bind to local addresses and you connect to actual addresses or DNS names. That's the first thing. Uh, what we will add later on are some kind of abstraction on that. So you can bind to logical names which get mapped onto actual physical addresses. But we assume the network is basically set up. Uh, a configuration issue, if you like. Most applications will have configuration files that tell applications where to connect to, that tell applications where their other their peers are. And again, service discovery is something that sounds obvious, necessary, useful, but makes your solution complex. It requires magic boxes that do things. It requires brokers. And we don't want that. We want the fewest possible moving pieces. The fewest possible moving pieces. If you don't need something there, it shouldn't be there. Uh, we have a question at the back, yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, what do you use internally? Do you uh, use actors like model or coming from that? I guess it's like an actor's model, yes. It's C++. Um, basically, hmm. basically it's, it's process thread, so there's no, there's no lightweight threading. Every uh, task in zero MQ, every thread has one or more sockets. Sockets are bound to threads, the process threads. And these threads can be in one process, on multiple processes, on multiple boxes. And the threads process messages of their queue or queues. I guess it's like an actor model, right? Yeah, and so how do you compare yourself to other offerings like Akka, for example, from the Scala world? Like what? Akka, A-K-K-A. -K -K -A. I'm no, sorry, I'm right. so ignorant, I don't know what Akka is. If you want to explain, I'll try to answer. It's but basically an actor-based um, distributed messaging. Does anyone uh, else, does anyone nodes. use Akka here or? No. No. It doesn't seem like. 
Feel free to ask questions on the dev list, the ZeroMQ dev list, and see what people say. High availability. Uh, mostly by not crashing. Mostly by not crashing. That's like, I know that kind of sounds stupid, but the, the weird thing about most messaging systems is that the, the biggest point of failure is the broker. The broker is in most messaging systems, the bottleneck that does all the work, has to have huge memory for queues, has to do all kind of weird stuff, and it crashes regularly, runs out of space and crashes. If you have no broker, which we don't need a broker, then your reliability goes up a lot. That's the first thing. Secondly, if you write your applications without locking, without the need for complicated multi-threading, then they're much simpler. And again, they will crash much less. So I'm not a great fan of making complex systems and then adding on layers to make them you know, somehow not crash as much. That doesn't, just, it, just, it just doesn't work. In my experience, make simpler, simpler, simpler things, and they will crash less. Um, if you need applications which are uh, redundant, you can do it easily. You can have multiple copies of applications. You can distribute data through multiple paths. One path can crash, the other path will carry on. And it's fast enough, it's fast enough to let you do that redund redundantly without actually you know, costing too much. Your network will, will survive two copies of the data going through, for example, quite happily. And it won't cost on the publisher side to send it twice. So the simplest reliability is to have redundancy in the network. As soon as you start doing things like detecting if a process crashes and then restarting it, then you have another process that does that, and nah, I'm not a fan of that. We, we, we do this in some applications, but it's just... And power fails, yeah. I mean, it, it, depends, it really depends on the kind of data you're processing and how expensive it is to, to apologize for a failure. Uh, what's the cost of a failure? If the cost of failure is, 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 is less than the cost of recovering, then don't recover, just pay it. Um, if the cost of a crash, if a crash happens once every five years and it costs you 100,000 euro to, 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 to apologize for the crash, to pay a customer, but it costs you a million to make a system that won't crash, then just let it crash. So you have to know what the cost is. And some data you can really afford to lose, and some data you cannot. So it depends on the kind of data, it depends on the cost of, of, of losing that data. And then you just put it in. We can't decide that in ZeroMQ. We do not know in our product how important it is for you to keep your data safe. So in general, 90% of data, 99% of data of cases is just transient. It can just be thrown away. If you don't get it in time, you can ask for it again. And it's like email, you know, I mean, how reliable is email? Well, it works pretty well, it's good enough. And now then I call and I say, you know, where's my email? Oh, it's in, it's in the spam filter. This happens rarely. You say, oops, up. When you say low level, um, how low level is it, for instance, in a subscribe case? Would the subscriber notice if the connection died? Uh, are there any kind of ping messages from? Right. So ZeroMQ takes care and hides the notion of connection. You don't see TCP connections, just there's no TCP in there conceptually. You do have a kind of a virtual circuit, a zero MQ connection, where a socket connects to a socket. But it's, it's, it's quite clever. Sockets cannot be there. You can connect to an endpoint that's not actually bound yet. So you can first connect, and then the server can then bind to the socket, and then the connection will come up and happen. The peers can go away and come back, and it'll reconnect automatically. Uh, queues are you know, created and destroyed automatically. That all happens invisibly. Because these are problems that we do know how to handle. We do know how to solve them properly. They can be packaged and reused. Ten minutes left. Okay. We have one more question, right? Somebody. Okay. So I'll change the subject completely now. Forget messaging, because it's the most boring subject in the universe, messaging. Um, something more interesting, we were discussing last night. You know, being a keynote speaker, you can talk about anything you like at all. So yeah, last night we were discussing this theory of, of pink and blue software. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> right. And the question was, why doesn't Google, uh, what's the thing, Google Buzz? No, Google Wave, uh, Google Buzz. Why doesn't it work? I mean, no one uses that, right? 
<laughs> so it's like, okay, Facebook is pink, Google is blue, right? This is working for you. So, you know, some software is pink and some software is blue, and some companies are pink, some companies are blue. I think most of us here make blue software. I think we can agree on that. So, you know, we like our software to be, you know, disciplined and, you know, we like to give commands, you know, like command line, you know, do this, do that. We don't like chatty software. So software shouldn't stop and say, are you really sure? Uh, what do you think about that? I'll propose you something. We maybe we make recommendation systems for people. We don't like them ourselves. We know what we want, right? We make blue software. And it's like Facebook. We, I mean, we're all on Facebook somehow, but we don't actually use it, right? We just, we're like all like lurkers. I'm, I'm a Facebook lurker. I just, I, things happen. I'm like, wow. And there's guys who actually update this. They say this once a day. I'm in a coffee bar. I'm doing this. I'm like, wow, this is really, this is really pink. I don't go there. Um, well, this is the thing. Twitter is, Twitter is, I think, is kind of confused. <laughs> I think Twitter is pink, but it tries to be, I, I don't like Twitter personally, and also people also tweet <coughs> unkind things about me, so I'm really, you can tweet that, by the way, you can quote me on that. I don't, I don't, I don't tweet, I don't use Twitter, I just like, why? I mean, why? And then retweeting, don't get me started on retweeting. It's like someone says something and then it, you repeat it ten times. It's like this. I can do it in four letters, plus one. So yeah, so ZeroMQ is blue software. It is absolutely blue. There's no chattiness in there. It will not interest the other gender. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Um, thank you so much for letting me rant and talk. Uh, I, I, just, I just love doing this. And um, thanks again to the organizers for this, this, amazing, this amazing event. This is the first year of Berlin Buzzwords, right? Yep. So it's going to become a bigger and bigger event. And one day it might, the whole event might fill a, fill a room in Fosdem. You never know. <laughs> Thank you all very much for being here as well. You're a great audience.